Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're so glad that you've joined us. This is a study of the Sabbath School lessons prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is based on the two small books in the New Testament, First and Second Thessalonians. And our title for this time is, is Thessalonica and Paul's Day. It's lesson number three in the series, and it will be uh, a study of the situation in the city of, of Thessalonica when Paul arrived there. Before we begin, would you bow your heads with us so we can pray? Our loving Father, we understand the challenges that Paul met. We try to imagine what it would have been like just to launch yourself into a new culture, um, a relatively new a language, a new society. Uh, Paul just not even knowing what to expect next, places he had never been before and yet with a burden on his heart for the people who lived there and how he could reach them with the gospel. So in this lesson, we will try to uh, ask your guidance to show us how we can better reach out to people perhaps that we may not understand so well. May that be our learning experience today as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. This lesson is quite unique in the way of Seventh-day Adventist Sabbath School lessons because it's basically not based on a passage of Scripture, although we will quote some from Scripture, but it's primarily talking about the historical backgrounds that we can dig up archaeological evidence, uh, other evidence uh, to help us understand the situation in Thessalonica. We hope that you will find this helpful because it will be background material for what we do the rest of this 13 series. Um, we will attempt to understand what was influencing the Thessalonians, Nikons or the Thessalonians at the time and how it might have influenced the spread of the gospel in that place. And just to get an idea of Paul's attitude, so of course he's the one who wrote this book, we need to look at 1 Corinthians 9 verses 19 through 22. I am a free man, nobody's slave, this is Paul talking, but I make myself everybody's slave in order to win as many people as possible. So that's his goal. While working with the Jews, I live like a Jew in order to win them. And even though, I'm, even though I myself am not subject to the law of Moses, I live as though I were when working with those who are in order to win them. In the same way, when working with Gentiles, I live like a Gentile outside the Jewish law in order to win Gentiles. This does not mean that I don't obey God's law. I'm really under Christ's law. Among the weak in faith, I become weak like one of them in order to win them. So I become all things to all people that I may save some of them by whatever means are possible. So that was Paul's attitude in approaching the churches that we're now talking about located in Macedonia. This was his entry point into Europe, we, we are reminded. And Paul was prepared to do whatever necessary without compromising the gospel. Because we know what it says over in Galatians 1, uh, 8 and 9, don't yeah. we? <laughs> over there he says, uh, even if an angel from heaven comes with a different message, he's wrong. So he wasn't going to compromise the gospel, but he would do whatever else he could outside of compromising gospel in order to win Jew or Gentile. What do you think some of that might have been? I mean, what would we today think of, as you say, compromising? What would we compromise and what would we not compromise? Well, in 1 Corinthians 10, Paul says, right following with the passage that I just read in 1 Corinthians 9, he says, when you go out to eat with somebody, eat whatever's on the plate in front of you. Would we have a problem with that? Yeah, I sure would. <laughs> for my health, I would, but not for my religion. Yeah, well, that's the question. And what part of the world you're in right now. Yeah, it would. Well, if you go to Texas, might you buy a pair of cowboy boots? If yeah. you go to California... And a 10-gallon hat? Yeah, if you come to California, you might buy sandals and uh, cutoffs. Yeah. And um, so it would be identifying with the customs 
of the location too. But, but is that not exactly what got the children of Israel into so many problems? They began yeah. to dress like them, they wanted to act like them, and the next thing you know, yeah. they were involved in their religions. But the point isn't to become like them, the point is to, be, to, to get close to them so they can become like you. That's the challenge. But the methodology for that was become like them. Buy, buy, buy cowboy boots in Texas, buy a shout out in... But uh, cowboy boots in Texas doesn't mean you have to change your theology. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> so remember that... Oh, go ahead. Some would uh, say that uh, what you read in 1 Corinthians was Paul being a chameleon. Mm-hmm. Okay. Respond to that. Well... Paul felt very strongly about his gospel. Let's be very clear about that. Remember that in Galatians 2, we just mentioned Galatians 1 a moment ago, in Galatians 2, he condemned Peter in public and to his face for wishy-washy on this very issue. Mm -hmm. So... I think, I think there's a principle here that we may be missed. Okay. You can cross things so far and no further, but he did not want to embarrass these people. Yeah. He did not also want to be like he probably was some years before, mm -hmm. getting around in his rich robes and putting his nose up in the air and looking down at people. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a principle there that he didn't want to yeah. mess with. I think so what happened to um, let everybody be persuaded in their own mind when you start well, doing that, when you start being so strong well, on something? Well, but hold on. Let's wait. Here's the issue. Let's, let's think about what's going on. And the first thing we have to notice, and, let's, and that's the next point, where did Paul go first when he arrived in Thessalonica? To the Jews. Jews. To the synagogue, to the Jews. Mm -hmm. And there he acted like a Jew, a conservative Jew. Okay? He probably dressed like them. <coughs> he acted like them. And then when they threw him out of the synagogue, he went to the Gentiles. Okay? So... Having said that, the question is, how do we, for the understanding of our series for this 13th Sabbath, how do we get to know what the background was in Thessalonica at that point in time? Well, it looks like he's been trying to find out what the background is. Yes. Isn't that, you know, when you get, come up to a group of people or some strange people, you have to learn how to communicate with them. Mm -hmm. And to communicate with them, you have to be able to know how they live, how they do things. Mm -hmm. And um, it's not like taking Greek or something and have some teacher telling you what the words are. You yeah. know, you got to kind of have, you got to actually watch people who speak the language, mm -hmm. what they do, and and whatever, so you know firsthand what the meanings are, the words are. I think a good example is a person who works in a prison uh, with prisoners. That doesn't mean he becomes a criminal, mm -hmm. but the person works to identify with the criminals so in the, in the prison so he can pull them out. And so Paul has to be a very strong Christian yes. in order to pull other people out of quicksand, yes. out of sin. And God is calling us to do that. And what happened to the Jews in the past is they were weak Christians. Mm -hmm. And they went and played in the quicksand with the people. Yeah. And God is calling us to be different, to pull people out of quicksand, mm -hmm. which takes a lot of strength. Exactly. Well, and we need to understand that in order to understand the biblical context, the biblical situation, because what we have in front of us is a couple of small books, mm -hmm. a few pages. Yes. So there's two parts to the context uh, that we're talking about. One part is the historical context, try to reconstruct as far as possible what was actually happening in Thessalonica at that point in time. And the other part is understanding the linguistic context. Uh, and that's a, a fairly precise science that we will probably leave mainly to the experts. But the precise science is basically trying to determine exactly what the different words in these two books, the original Greek words, meant to the first audience that listened to it. So there's those two aspects to what we're talking about here. Did they speak Greek? Yes, they spoke Greek. Yeah. <laughs> Language changes well, so much. A, yeah. There's a historical and archaeological context to this too, that records mm -hmm. go back 
way back. Mm -hmm. We're very fortunate in our day and age that a lot of this has been compiled, but you mm -hmm. tend to think of it as fairly recent. No, there are records going back to ancient Rome and even Greece mm -hmm. that give a little indication, I think, yeah. here in the background. Did you say where Thessalonica is located? Are you getting to that? Well, we can review that. We talked about that a little bit in our first couple of lessons, but it's located the, at the top of a little, uh, actually, gulf. It's the Mac Gulf uh, in, in Macedonia, which in more recent times has been a part of Greece. It's not far from the border of, uh, a little west of the border between um, Asia and Europe, near what today would be uh, Istanbul. Uh, west of that a little ways. He, he'd gone already to Philippi. Remember, he'd been, in, he'd been beaten and imprisoned in Philippi, and he and Silas were there singing in the prison kind of thing. And then they, <coughs> they, they got out of prison, and the authorities said, please leave our city. And from there, he went to Thessalonica. So he arrived, mm -hmm. in effect, <coughs> bruised and bleeding, and now he's trying to convince these people here that the message <coughs> he has is, is the most important thing they've ever heard. And that's a challenge. <coughs> that's a real challenge. They said, please leave the city? Well, in that's they, real they, carry, they, they carry a big stick when they say An it. An offer he couldn't refuse. <laughs> yeah, well, I, that didn't come too clear when you said, can you please leave our city? Well, that's what they <laughs> said first. And then they said, let's escort you out. Mm. Escort you out? <laughs> Which that door did still you sounds a little bit nice. <laughs> Which door did you come in? Let me help you out. <laughs> um, but the purpose of this lesson isn't so much to understand Paul's thinking. That'll be what we're trying to do for the rest of the quarter. The real purpose of this lesson is to try to understand what the Thessalonians <coughs> were thinking when they uh, heard Paul's message and what was their background. Um, and, and for, for someone who's approaching a, a new culture, a new situation, a new city, Paul recognized that one of the biggest challenges he's, he's going to face is, is not just convincing them of the truth of the gospel. The biggest challenge <coughs> might be convincing them the, of the non-truth of their current beliefs. It's very often the case that it's more difficult to get people to unbelieve the wrong ideas they have than it is to get them to believe the right ideas. So that would be the next point. Look at, look at John eleven forty eight to give us a little feel for how things were under Rome in those days. <coughs> were these people Greek citizens? Were they They all? were Greeks. It, it was <coughs> a fairly uh, consistent culture. I mean, uh, Well, Thessalonica. It wasn't a melting pot. Not so, well, a little bit. Thessalonica was located on the main and I mean really main east-west road. The one that the, the, the Romans said, if there's, if there's a problem out in the east somewhere, we're going to come charging down this road to send troops out there. So this was the main road from Rome to anywhere in the east. And they were right across it, right in the middle of it. Okay. So, uh, and they were, they had five mayors in the city. They were, <coughs> they were relatively independent, but they were under Rome. They had called upon Rome to come out and, and help them in a very difficult time when there was fighting between different cities. And as a result, Rome said, well, great, you're on our side already. We'll give you relative independence. But remember, you're under us. Okay. So that's sort of where we are. Well, here's what, what the Jews said about this situation. I'm reading from John 11, starting with verse 48. Talking in this case about Christ and about the impact he might have on the Jews' relation to Rome. <coughs> if we let him go on in this way, everyone will believe in him and the Roman authorities will take action and destroy our temple and our nation. One of them named Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, said, What fools you are! Don't you realize that it is better for you to let one man die for the people instead of having the whole nation destroyed? So, what's he trying to imply there? He's really saying, you need to have one man die so we don't lose our power. Well, and, and that's certainly true. But the question is, this Christianity, what was its status in the world? 
Christianity as a religion? It was the not thought of well. Brand new. Well, it was brand, brand new. Brand new. Not many people knew about it. So what did that imply? People don't like to change. People don't like to change, but more than that, it would be considered illegal and unauthorized. Challenge to Rome. Yes, and it would be thought of as a challenge to Rome. If you By start the Romans? By the Romans. Oh, yes, yes, absolutely. If you start up a new set of beliefs and people are really committed to it, that's a threat. Rome was in its relative infancy, but it exerted enough power that you didn't fool with them. Yeah. And the high priests were partly right, but I don't think that was the core of what bothered them. But there was an overtone. They could have been in serious trouble. Uh, they were sure in trouble with the Jews. Yeah. But, uh, well, so here's the question. Do you think if Jesus had, suppose they had made Jesus king, would the Romans have come and tried to destroy their nation? Eventually. Remember that. Remember the Romans, how much tribute he paid. <laughs> well, maybe. Remember the Romans' policy was this: if a religion is a national religion, okay, so long as they didn't, you know, stir up too much trouble, leave them alone. Christianity is a brand new religion; it cannot claim any national heritage. It's something new. In general, Rome's attitude toward those kind of things is squash them before they get started. Yeah. And. And yet, if, they, if the mm -hmm. Jews had taken on and believed in Jesus, Rome would not have destroyed them. Maybe not. Well, we're told they wouldn't. Okay. They would have become powerful and they would have been sitting yeah. on top of the pile. If they had been truly Christian, you mean? Well, that's what I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay, I got you. But some of the later uh, Caesars, they were gods in their own. There's another yeah. factor. They and we're gonna, we're gonna talk about that yes. coming you up You mean here. this man that went around healing people Raising people from the dead was a threat to the nation. Well, okay, there's two things that we're talking about we there. Gary mentioned one, and that's that the Sanhedrin may have been most of all worried about if Jesus took over, they would lose their positions because obviously they were, they were not in line with his kind of religion, his kind of government. So their position was more important than people being healed and raised from the dead and being... In their eyes, yes. That's born. one side of it. And the other side, did they really believe that if suddenly Rome said, hey, they're starting up a new religion in Judea, did they really believe that Rome would have come to just smash it at all costs? And, and the answer is we don't know for sure. Yeah, truth, yeah. truth wasn't worth fighting for. If it had been a, a massive threat against the Romans, mm -hmm. Yes, they'd have come in and squashed. But if it was just a, uh, a religion among the Jews, they wouldn't have cared at all. Probably. Anyway, that, those are the issues. That yeah. You heard what Caiaphas said. Yes, he, uh, but he would made a statement. The Romans shall come and take away both our place and our nation. Well, mm -hmm. that's his sales pitch, whether yeah. it's true or not. Yeah. No, I, I agree. Yeah. But I'm, I, 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 we need to be fair to say there, there are at least two aspects to this mm. possible. Well, there were reasons why they had a, a Roman garrison in Jerusalem. I mean, the Jews had been prickled about this whole thing for quite a yeah, while. Exactly. <laughs> well, coming back to Thessalonica, because that's what we're supposed to talk about. Back in 168 BC, they had, as I mentioned, this squabble with one of their rival city-states, and they realized that they were probably not going to win in this squabble. And so they called on Rome that was just rising to power at that point in time. They called on Rome to come to join them on their side. Rome was all too happy to do that. And of course, the other group backed off under those circumstances. And so Thessalonica came to be known as a pro-emperor, pro-Roman city. Okay? But of course, what happens when you've got a foreign power ruling over you? The natives get restless. The natives get restless. Well, we need to be a little more specific than that. You've got to pay taxes. Right, you've got to give a percentage of all kinds of stuff. You've got to follow new rules. And before long, you know, and people... And the hardest on the, the ones that make the least. And this kind of stuff is the hardest on the people who are at the bottom. Yeah. So the poorer classes, even though they lived in a so-called free city, were struggling. And it wasn't easy for them to survive here. Well, 
Which raises another question in our minds, or perhaps should at least, to what extent should our Christianity be a response to the political and economic situation in which we live? Should our Christianity be How a How should it respond? How should it respond to the political and economic situation? Do we just pretend like the economics has nothing at all to do with our religion, we're just sort of up here floating above the clouds, or, or are we involved? Should we be involved? And if, if, if there's a tremendous loss of, of economic power and a lot of people are out of jobs, et cetera, et cetera, should the church be doing something about that? Should, be, should we be speaking to that? Should we say, hey, this is an opportunity to spread the gospel? I mean, how should we respond to this kind of stuff? Well, it depends on whether you're speaking of uh, politically yes. or as a church. No, I'm, I'm talking about as a Christian. church. But members of the church uh, dealing with other members of the church in a benevolent way as opposed to uh, giving money to a political organization to accomplish I'm, that? I'm talking about, okay, evil, bad times have hit. Yeah. And a lot of people are out of work. Yeah. How should the Adventist church respond? How should our Sabbath school class respond? How should our local church respond to that situation in our community? Should we pretend like it has nothing to do with theology, it has nothing to do with us, and just carry on as we have been? Or should we be out there trying to do something about it? I knew a church that started a job training program, and they also had a um, housing um, situation where the people could come and stay for a few weeks mm -hmm. and then they would try to find them housing and they had um, all sorts of programs that the government usually does but maybe the church can do it better I don't yeah. know I, th I think we've got to be uh, involved to a point there's a line again that you've got to be careful you don't cross mm -hmm. but medical work you, h helping the poor with maybe Necessi basic necessities of life. On the other hand, we've just had big conferences back east about freedom of religion. There's been people from all over the world came. We've been involved with that. We're not the only church. I think if there's an access to that while it is legal, we'd be stupid to ignore it. You know, there's something else that I don't know where we're not. When you ask that question, we've got to get real on. If the yeah. economic stuff goes bad, we may not have enough money to do anything. We may not have jobs. We may be starving. Everybody right. may be starving all at once. Mm -hmm. I think the only thing that might be different is that the attitudes may be different between peoples. Some mm -hmm. people may react in a violent way. Some other people may hold back in that respect. But it, it sounds like, well, you know, whenever something goes wrong with the world, we look at ourselves as above, that it's not going to happen to us. So then, then we'll go and help them out. But, but economically speaking, it goes across the board. Mm -hmm. So you've got to look at well, it that way. But you, you need to recognize, and maybe I'm biased in speaking about this, I work in a, in a, in a low-income clinic. Mm -hmm. And these are the people I deal with every day. And we run a, a, a pantry. Uh, across the across the parking lot from us, we speak. We feed something like fifteen hundred families a week. But Should we happens, be doing that? But what happens if the situation comes? You don't have any money to feed those people anymore. Well, that, that can all that's happen. That's another story. I don't think. I think that is a story that could happen. Yeah. I mean, I'm a little leery of the programs. Mm -hmm. I would rather see each of the individuals of the church have a commitment to anybody they meet, to their neighbors, as, as selfless, helpful, right. with, and, and not substitute that for a church or a state or a city organizational thing. Because what, what it seems to be at this point in time is that we have all of these organizations with their programs and we get the idea that, well, we can give some money to that thing, and that takes care of our, of our yeah. duty. And I don't think that's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we would be much better. There's no question about it. W the church would be much better off if each one of us individually that's were right. doing that. Now, and we could yep. do that whether times are tough or whether they're not. The, well, the, 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 the local the question of whether you, do you want to still do what's right or not. 
I think. I mean, more. I mean that's the big thing. No matter what the economic. What what's yeah. doing what's right. Well, do what's right because it's right. I, th I think in the final right? analysis, <laughs> over, we are all going to be reduced to the level of what Paul was trying to organize mm -hmm. back then: church members helping church members. I think that's right. We, I partly we agree with you, but I think not everybody can necessarily go door to door. I think. Yeah, that's for part of the problem. people have got funds, you can put funds in good places. You've got to be careful. It's what you do with money, not the fact you've got it. I think I'm there's sure. a lot we can do. We can uh, teach people how to grow things. We can teach people how to cook good beans yeah. and rice and cheap food. Uh, we can te teach people how to take care of some medical needs yes. uh, without having to run to a doctor. So these are things that we, we are always reading about, and yes, we know how to do them and stuff, but really do we share them okay we okay. need to come back to Thessalonica okay Thessalonica had its own religion as a city this religion was known as the Kabiros cult Kabiros was apparently a young man who spoke up for the disenfranchised poor and powerless for some reason he was eventually murdered by his two brothers notice these comments from scholars Kabiros was the patron god of Thessalonica originally of manual laborers, but by the first century co-opted into the civic cult, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. By the way, if you're interested in some of this material that we have dug up for this lesson, um, it will all be available as a handout that you can print off of our website at theox.org. That's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. And you can look up the Sabbath School lessons there and download some of this material if you choose. Kabiros was a hero who had been murdered by his two brothers. His head had been crowned and wrapped in a royal purple cloth, so the legend goes, and carried on a spear point to, the consecrated, uh, to be consecrated and buried at the foot of Mount Olympus, which of course was the home of the gods, by his guilt-ridden and justice-avoiding, we might add, brothers. In his honor, they established a cult for him. Sources are divided over whether the brothers took the phallus of Bacchus with them from Mount Olympus, and you're starting to see that uh, the cultures there were uh, not just um, uh, trying to honor the dead. Intermittently, Kabiris returns, this is the legend, with his full powers restored and is able to help in the manufacture of iron and the performance of manual labor, coins pitch him with forge and hammer, perform magical feats for the needy, provide freedom for slaves, and empower sexual fulfillment. So you get a little idea. Kabiros worship is especially interesting. It involved an invitation, and uh, initiation in special robes, confessing sins, cleansing through water baptism and symbolic immersion in the blood of the martyred God, Kabiric art, which there are still mur murals preserved in Samothrace, portrayed dance that was lighthearted, light hearted, bacchic, noisy, and grotesquely phallic. Now for those of you who don't immediately recognize those terms, Bacchus was the god of the grape harvest. Yeah, wine. So you, you're talking about wine here, and of course the phallic symbols had to do with the fact that they worshipped reproduction and sex. Uh, that was one of the main you points know, of... So with enough wine and that mm -hmm. philosophy it could get pretty wild. Yes. But this is a human thought up religion. Yeah. So we're going to help the poor, but we're going to have an orgy while we're doing it. Yes. That's the idea. And, and we're going to call this our religion. Notice that it was believed that Kabiros would return to life from time to time to help the lower classes and bring justice to the city. This is between parties? Yes. It's a rough approximation of the crucifixion. Of yeah. They also believed that he would restore the city to its earlier greatness. That gave a flame of hope to the lower classes. These kinds of beliefs might seem incredible to us, but remember that Herod believed that Jesus was John the Baptist come back to life. And in case you had looked at those verses recently, look at Mark 6. This is verse 14. Now King Herod heard about all this because Jesus' reputation had spread everywhere. Some people were saying John the Baptist has come back to life. That is why he has this power to perform miracles. Others, however, said he's Elijah. Others said he's a prophet, like one of the prophets a long ago. When Herod heard it, he said, he is John the Baptist. I had his head cut off, but he has come back to life. Does that sound at all like what I just read to you about the Kabiros cult? 
But very, very similar. This, this uh, man, they don't know if he really existed or not, or if it was just a, a, a legend. Well, he, he probably, th there was probably originally somebody by that name who existed. Of course, by the time you turn him into a, a god, uh, all kinds of things change. There must have been all kinds of rumors going around. You yeah. Know, when they when they heard all this stuff, sure. even even um, you know the leaders, you know during that so time. Can't you imagine Paul going in there and saying after after knowing this, like he did on on at Athens, mm -hmm. where he said, "You've got this God that uh, you don't know about. Let me tell you about him." He goes in here and says, "You've got this God that does all these things, and you're waiting for it to happen." Let me tell you about how it really did it. Yeah. Well, do you think it was just an accident that the worship of Kabirus included blood sacrifices and being baptized in the blood to commemorate his martyrdom? There were a number of similar cults around the Mediterranean world in those days. They had various forms of dying and rising saviors who often spoke up for the lower classes. Sometimes they were believed to have human mothers and divine fathers and to have died martyrs' deaths, and they were expected to rise to glory at some time in the future. Does that sound vaguely familiar? Who do you suppose was behind these ideas that mimic the life and ministry of Jesus? Satanic, was it? Satan trying to make the story of Jesus seem like just another pagan cult? Sure. Yeah. Well, he tried. You look down through the ages, there's always been blood human sacrifice, <coughs> mingling with the spirits. When we see how Satan, uh, to the best of his ability, tried to imitate the first coming of Christ, what do you think he will do as we approach the second coming of Christ? Do we have to guess? More counterfeits. More counterfeits. Yes. There's and one. will be better and bigger. Better and bigger. Yes. There's, it'll be worldwide this time. Yeah. There's one other thing we need to note about the Kabir's cult. And the days of Caesar Augustus, now here remember this is a local religious phenomenon at Thessalonica. But in the days of Caesar Augustus, people began to worship him as a god. In the area around Thessalonica, the Romans proclaimed that, in fact, Caesar Augustus was Kabirus come back to life. Oh, yeah. So he said, well, you, you're, looking for, you're looking for your god to come back? We got him, here he is. Just like you said they were going to talk about Jesus, right? What a despot. Yeah. Well, we, we have to remember Augustus and Tiberius actually saddled the life of Christ and, le and later on. So, yep. I mean, this was very active there. Mm -hmm. So, as it turns out, the occupying authority tried to co-opt the hopes and spiritual beliefs of the people to support their cause. The common people were left without a meaningful uh, religion, but it also meant that if someone arrived claiming to be like Kabirus, he would be perceived as an immediate threat. But probably the most stunning example of Augustus's claims, Augustus Caesar now, is found in the Priene inscription dating to approximately 9 BC. Now this is four years before Christ is born. Out comes this, it was actually a part of a calendar. It, and this is worded in words that aren't so immediately familiar to us. It, some of it sounds a little strange, but bear with me. It seemed good to the Greeks of Asia in the opinion of the high priest Apollonius of Menophilus as Xenitus, since, provi since providence, which has ordered all things and is deeply interested in our life, has set in most perfect order by giving us Augustus, whom she filled with virtu virtue that he might benefit humankind, sending him as a savior, both for us and for our descendants, that he might end war and arrange all things, and since he, Caesar, by his appearance excelled even our anticipations, surpassing all previous benefactors, not even leaving to posterity any hope of surpassing what he has done. So what are they saying here? <laughs> He's so good, nobody will ever match him, right? And since the birthday of the god Augustus was the beginning of the good tidings for the world that came to, by reason of him, which Asia resolved in Smyrna, and, and etc. And that's found, uh, you can find some of these things quoted if you look in the right place. I wonder if he internet. had a speechwriter. Yeah. <laughs> now are we talking about 
history here before Jesus? Yes. Yeah. Just before, before Jesus. Jesus. Now, I thought, I may be wrong about this, but I thought the um, emperors, you know, of Rome weren't really considered gods until after Jesus. Augustus was the first one to be really thought of. And then they, they died out for a while, and sometimes it rose, and it, yeah. it, was, it waxed oh, and it okay, waned so during, during the times of the Caesars. Did that wax and wane with uh, economic times? That's a good question. I don't know. It probably had more to do, actually wing to, some to do with the egos of the Caesars, too. Well, that's true. And which but family the Caesars were coming from, they yeah. changed. It's not like yeah. sort of British royalty. It chopped and changed as to who killed who. But you would who think, you know, when, when you're desperate, yeah. you're, you're desperate for some hope of a change. When you're at your lowest mm -hmm. point, that's when you're going to grab on to. Yeah. Well, by contrast, Paul was speaking, here's your point, Norm, Paul was speaking to his hearers not of fictitious so-called human gods, but of a real Messiah Christ, who had really died, really rose to life, and directly provided to his followers, proved to his followers that he had done so, Jesus is no huckster. I mean, he appeared to hundreds of people, yeah. and they have witnesses of it, not just once, but many times. So he could document what he was talking he about. He could document what he's talking about, see? And so I, I can imagine if, you, if he told him a little bit about what Jesus had done and said, yes, he really died, yes, he really rose to life, they said, voila, you know? This is what we've been looking for, right? At least they wouldn't have uh, thrown it out as totally ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. Well... But then the question is, would, would would Paul was talking about go the direction they wanted it to go? Well, I mean, that's one of the issues. Yeah. Look at 1 John 2, 15 to 17. Now, this was written about 30 years after Thessalonians. And John is writing, Do not love the world or anything that belongs to the world. If you love the world, you do not love the Father. Everything that belongs to the world, what the sinful self desires, Think about our Kabiris cult now. What people see and want, and everything in this world that people are so proud of, none of this comes from the Father. It all comes from the world. The world and everything in it that people desire is passing away, but those who do the will of God live forever. You know, that verse kind of confused me because don't love the world and what's in the world. I love going out into nature and the wilderness, but... and. God makes that. That's, so he that, means, that's not what he's talking about. That's here. not what well, he's talking about. What does about. world mean in that case? Is it like a domain? It means mm -hmm. the sinful propensities, the, the sinful cultural traits of, of the people around you. Right the self-based you know, self motivations. Places of sin. Mm -hmm. Maybe yeah. it means the things that man make too, like cars, houses. Yeah, you know. yeah but it, it looks like it has a different meaning back then than it does now. Oh, no, you look into the back. Because... Well, well, some of the Caesars were so gross, even their people that supported them got tired of them. I mean, yeah. They got up to all kinds of stuff. Yeah, but, you know, when, they, when, when people start using this term, the world, you know, nowadays, is it the same type of the world as back then? Do it you was think the that? world as opposed to heaven, as opposed to Christ. The world? Yeah, I mean, that was... I mean that was the that was the 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 symbol for all evil the world yeah it it wasn't necessarily mean the earth no no though, no, right? no, no so no. it so it's kind of an evil domain right okay fine. type of thing oh, yeah so so uh, when people start looking at the earth and everything that's going on in the earth it does not necessarily mean the world, the world. because no. there's not good in a, happening no, not on a, the earth in a religious too. sense no. Yeah. Well, have you found that any of the things in this world bring real long-term happiness? What is it that earthly things, why is it that earthly things do not seem to bring long-term satisfaction? Does your Christianity help with this problem? What is it about Christianity that does bring real happiness? Does that have anything to do with selfishness, which is the world's approach, Satan's approach, mm -hmm. versus love, which is God's approach? Christianity explains what's happening in the world and some of the situations. It's, it's a, 
great aid to understand what's going on. Mm -hmm. it's true. Does, does Christianity come to you by way of the world? No. But I'm in the world. Yeah. Well, then how did it get to me? You're supposed to be in the world, but not of the world. I know, but before that, how in the world did I get the past so I could be out of the world? Well, that's what we're talking about. How did Paul do that in the city of Thessalonica? Okay. We do not know to what degree Paul understood the Kabiris cult and its implications. He probably did pretty well. But it's not hard to see how a Messiah who truly rose from the dead might excite the hopes, especially the poor classes of people in Thessalonica. Thus we see that in a very short period of time, the Thessalonian church was established. Do you suppose that this church ate together, worked together, shared their wealth as did the early Jerusalem church after Pentecost? Now we're not told, but what do you think? You think that's a possibility? If Paul had anything to do with it, yes. Yeah. Well, do you think that they came together because it was so close to this other thing that you're talking about, the, mm. the cult? Mm. So probably there was a demonstration of the Spirit, like it happens all over the place. And um, do you think the Thessalonians? Do you think the Thessalonians received the baptism of the Holy Spirit like the disciples did on Pentecost? Well, just as much as all these other churches that got raised anywhere mm. else, don't you think? Or is it? There had to be some people in there thinking, <laughs> this religion isn't right. I mean, God talks to people even though they're not Christians. And, you know, what I see going on and, you know, this cult that we have going uh, is not right. And so when Paul came and told them something, it was believable. It's like when you hear the truth, you go, yes, that's it. Mm hmm Mm -hmm. That's only if they could speak their language, too. We he could. He yeah. could. They would really have Greek. Any, any record of whether or not they did he heal the sick and raise the dead. But it, it's possible. Mm -hmm. Well, if we did something like that today, we're, we're trying to put ourselves back in the Thessalonian situation, but suppose the church said, we're having a potluck every Sabbath and anybody who wants can come. Would we attract loafers and lazy people? Yes, and we do. There, there's always. <laughs> <laughs> should, we, should we stand by? <laughs> it's so factual. <laughs> yes. That's always the discussion, yes. And, uh, uh -huh. yeah. Should we tell people who stand by the road and ask for a handout to get to work in the same way that Paul did to the, said to the Thessalonians? He said, we'll get to this later on, he says, he who does not work should not eat. I think the principle holds good, but unfortunately it's got a little thin these days. <laughs> I see. Well, clearly one of the secret successes in evangelism, secrets of success in evangelism, is understanding the people to whom you're talking. We must learn to meet people where they are. At the same time, we must never leave our Christianity behind. And there will always be a conflict between us and our Christianity, and the people and their beliefs. And the challenge about how to make that come together is, is, is the challenge of what we're talking about. Multiple experiences have shown that people are most often open, and here's, a, here's an important point, people are most often open to changes in their thinking and behaviors in times of disruption or change. What kind of changes are we talking about? Economic turmoil, we've already mentioned that. Political strife, war, weddings, divorces, dislocations, even a move from one place to another. Health challenges, even death. These changes cause people to ask themselves serious questions. People find themselves in a different set of circumstances, and they have to establish new relationships. Could we as Seventh-day Adventists use this information to help spread the gospel? What do you think? Should we be reading the obituary columns in the newspaper and containing the families of the, uh, and contacting the families of the bereaved? You know about some people do that, Joanne, a church that, that provides free uh, uh, 
basically funerals and so forth? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, they will provide funerals for anybody who wants. Uh, mm -hmm. not, not the, yeah, the pastor will do the funeral and the ladies will do the potluck for the family. Yeah. And I think it's a wonderful ministry. They have yeah. people in their church that have never gone to church before. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what about, you know, we, I think probably all of us at one time or another have heard of the so-called welcome wagon mm. program where you welcome new people into your city. Uh, it's an organization which is intended to inform new citizens about the facilities and cultural attractions of the city to which they have moved. Should well, yeah. we be out there and say, guess what, folks? There's a church here that would like to invite you to come and join us. Well, you know, there's something basic here that I think sometimes we need to think about is that we have no right to tell someone else um, about a system like Christianity unless we know that that system is the truth and is better and helps, helps people. We have to be firmly grounded in our faith and see how it helps us and how it can help others before we dare offer it to anyone. Yeah. Well, I thought the idea was just get a bunch of people in your church. No. Get a bunch of people there, man. Have all kinds of baptisms and count them up. No, we, well, we need do to that? wait until we're firmly grounded before we try to help somebody out. But we need to recognize, and, and this is a good point, we need to recognize that even baptism and joining a new church is a disruption in people's lives and a disruption of their way of thinking. Now, hopefully it's a good disruption, but it still shakes things up. And thus it leaves them in a somewhat unstable position, at least at first. And many of them, unfortunately, find that a little too unsettling. And, and as we know, a lot of them, in the first few months after joining the church, exit through the back door. Only to come back in again after a while, I think. Once, once you've tasted uh, something that's good, I think uh, eventually, you know, you have to ponder Some do. it. Mm -hmm. I don't at all. Not all. I'm glad you're so positive. Yeah. In the Mediterranean world of Paul's day, there was a proliferation of popular philosophers. The Greeks particularly loved to hear people talk, discuss, and debate. Remember the stories that you may have read about at the Areopagus of Samaras Hill. It was a, almost a debating society. There were public forums. These so-called street preachers, some called them, were expected to earn the right to speak by demonstrating the results of their recommendations in their own lives. Mm -hmm. Physician, heal thyself was a well-known concept in their world. Okay, look at, you know, you don't come and you're 200, 300 pounds and say, let me, let me advertise my new weight loss program, you know. Uh, you know there, was, there was a preacher on TV and he wasn't an Adventist and I think he was trying to get into the health message. And this man must have weighed near 300 pounds telling people what vitamins to take. And he did not look very credible at all. Mm -hmm. So that's what I mean. You have to really be grounded in your faith. Well, physician he alive himself was a major major concept in the world of Paul's day. So it should be obvious that there are many parallels between those popular preachers and our friend Paul. But Paul's approach was somewhat different. Although he began his work often in public places and usually starting in the synagogues, he sought to form a lasting community. He asked the people not See, because the, the hucksters, what would they do? They would arrive in town, they would cause a big show, they would try to collect money, they would do various things, and then psh, just as fast they're gone. Mm -hmm. You know, another thing in Christianity, and, and I think we have to say this too, is that when some of them are sick, um, have diseases, and are going through trouble, that doesn't mean that you're not a Christian. And I think the marvel of Christianity is it helps these people be a model for other people on how Christianity helps you through these problems. So to be a Christian, you don't have to be rich, thin, and all that. But um, I've gotten so much inspiration to see people go through sickness and uh, adversity. Mm -hmm. So Paul is saying, come out, join us, let's form a better world. He's saying Christianity is not just being convinced by some kind of wise speech that sounds good, but it's an, a, a, a uh, an ent entrance into your life of a supernatural external power called God. And the power, this power makes a real difference in people's lives. 
Well, furthermore. That sounds pretty technical. Yeah. Maybe he just came in down and told them that um, God actually came down and, and showed us how to live. Yeah. And this is what he told us. Yeah. Well, furthermore, unfortunately, many of the street preachers were hucksters. Mm -hmm. Not only would they take advantage of the listeners financially, but also sometimes sexually as well. Thus, a great deal of cynicism existed about street preachers. Paul did his very best to avoid any of that type of criticism by generally refusing support from his listeners. He worked hard, sometimes working all night so he could preach all day. His suffering and his absolute commitment to what he preached and the fact that he did not ask for any personal gain set Paul apart from others we've talked about. So it's another ploy of Satan's that if he knows, Satan knows God's going to work through preachers, He's going to bring up some really terrible preachers to turn people off mm -hmm. so that the real preachers have a hard time. Um, well, they, they do it for a reason. I mean, they're, they're trying to get money or some benefit yeah. from it. And Paul went out there and he, he actually tried to show that he was, he was pure in his motives, that he mm -hmm. was trying to tell you these things. I don't need your money. Don't give me your money. Mm -hmm. And that, that was probably pretty shocking back then. It probably yeah. blew the whole thing around. Yeah, look, look at Philemon, the first couple of verses. There's only one chapter in Philemon. Look at the first couple of verses. And what do you notice in here that's interesting? From Paul, a prisoner for the sake of Christ Jesus, that's his standard greeting, and from our brother Timothy to our friends and fellow, friend and fellow worker Philemon, and the church that meets in your house, and our sister Apphia and our fellow soldier Archippus. The church that meets in your house, and if you read Romans 16, 5, 1 Corinthians 16, 19, Colossians 4, 15, you'll find other passages which refer to the idea that churches met in local homes. Why was that? Because there wasn't a big deal about church buildings back then. Well, and if you're, if you're an illegal, unauthorized church, it's a little hard to build a big fancy edifice, isn't it? Well, it... it sounded like back then church meant people, right? Now so church looks like a building with a steeple in front. That's what they see, think yeah. now when you say church. Well, in many places of the world today, churches are, Christian churches are in homes. Mm -hmm. So that still goes on because they are not, Yes. Um, they cannot build a church in their country. Mm -hmm. Well, there were two kinds of homes, just to clarify something, we're trying to understand the Thessalonian situation. There were two kinds of churches. The fairly wealthy had a, houses that w tended to go around either in a U-shape or sometimes in a complete quadrangle, and there was a fairly large court in the middle. These courts would, would handle up to be, between 30 and 100 people. So they would, they would form quite a nice place to have a church. By contrast, many of the poor lived in what they call insula, these insula were, were small little apartments, usually located above a shop or above a business somehow or other, at which they often worked. And these places couldn't handle more than just a few people at a time um, in terms of having a church there. So ideally, a home located near the center of the city would also be an advantage so that the newly, for a newly formed Christian church, people would see what was going on there, uh, they would be close to the places where people worked and so forth. It would be easy for people to find out about the church. Have you ever worshipped in a home church? Yeah. Yeah. Many churches, big churches, they break into small home groups during the week. Mm -hmm. That's not the same as having a church that's primarily focused in a home. I don't think in Southern California I've ever heard of a home church. No. Probably not. Uh, there's been a court case, either California or Arizona, not that long back, over holding a church service in your house if it wasn't licensed when there's a building elsewhere. Well, That's sure. another complication we have to face these days. Mm -hmm. You can't always do it in every state in your house. Mm -hmm. so there's so a lot of people, though, trying to get tax write-offs for nothing. Yeah. Well, and that's probably what... what Actually, there was a thing like that in Orange County. Yeah. And the, thing that, and the thing that brought it to the attention was the cars. Yeah. And the, the 
neighbors didn't want the cars, so they parked out in front of the street. Yeah, yeah. Well, we notice in Acts 18, 1 to 3, some interesting other aspects of all this. After this, Paul left Athens and went on to Corinth. There he met a Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, for the emperor Claudius had ordered all the Jews to leave Rome. So there's one of the points at which we can sort of nail down histor a historical fact and sort of know the timing of these things. Paul went to see them and stayed and worked with them because he earned his living by, tent making, by making tents, just as they did. He held discussions in the synagogue every Sabbath, trying to convince both Jews and Greeks. So here's a couple that said, come and join us, we'll work together, we'll help mutually support each other, and we'll support the gospel. Pharisees tended to be quite wealthy. One almost had to be wealthy to be able to do all the things that he needed to do to practice Phariseeism. For example, they fasted two days a week. As a Roman citizen and a Pharisee, and later a member of the Sanhedrin, Paul was almost certainly originally fairly well-to-do. Did he regard working with his hands as a disgrace or something below him? Every Jew was expected, especially the males, was expected to learn a manual trade by which he could support himself during hard times. And Paul had done that, and he used it. Well, how, does, how well does our local church interact with the community? Are we part of that community in the sense of being involved? Is our church locked in a siege mentality, perhaps, in which we, we isolate ourselves from the dangers of the world so much that we don't influence this world at all? Should Adventists by foremost, be foremost in getting involved in community help projects? Or are such things just a part of the social gospel and do not have anything real impact on, on people's lives? Well, let's not fool ourselves. Presenting the gospel in a way that is attractive to a given community and meets their needs is a challenge. Do we understand them? Do we understand what the, re the real needs are? In our, even in our community, the gospel will be most effective when it's perceived as meeting the real needs of the people. One example of Paul's meeting needs where they were is the story of not eating meat offered to idols, and we don't have time to talk about that here, but Paul really went on a limb on that one. Uh, 1 Corinthians 8 and 10 and Romans 14, if you want to read about it. Well, how, do we, how are we doing in our day? Are we in any way like Paul, reaching into communities, trying to find out what people believe, how we can reach them, how we can reach them for the gospel? Remember, that was Paul's goal. And that's our challenge in this series of lessons, and I hope that you found our stuff today worthwhile. See you next week.